not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made by hands, eternal in the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the honor of the Lord.
Grace and mercy and peace to you from God, the Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My text is the, uh, is the gospel reading for today. The temperature today is supposed to reach, I guess, 84 degrees. So I guess you could say summertime has arrived in western New York. And uh, when summertime arrives, uh, I try to keep my messages relatively short. I guess the key word is relatively uh, but uh, we'll see if I meet my own standard. But what I what I want to do today is 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 look at today's gospel and cut to the chase. Just look at today's gospel, kind of cut to the chase. I want to offer you some explanation for what a lot of people would consider a difficult gospel reading, and then offer some commentary. Applying it to uh, our society, our church body, and our own congregation. Mark chapter 3. You are probably aware that Mark's gospel is the shortest gospel in the New Testament. And it's only 16 chapters. That's what we'll be spending most of our time this summer, Mark's gospel. Uh, but by the time we get to chapter 3, by the time we get to chapter 3, a whole lot of stuff has already happened. We've had Jesus' birth, Jesus' baptism, Jesus' temptation. We've had the call of Simon and Andrew. We've had Jesus in his first preaching tour. We've had the call of Matthew. We've heard uh, Jesus teaching on fasting and on the Sabbath. We want to heal people and call uh, the remaining of the 12 disciples. That's, that's within three chapters. 93 verses! <laughs> Get all that done. Which brings us to today's gospel. It says Jesus went home. And uh, the commentary is duped out. Biblical scholars are duped out. This doesn't mean went home. We know it means Capernaum. The region of Capernaum. Whose house was he staying in? Some of them say Peter, and some of them say Andrew, and some say it was a neighbor. It doesn't matter. He, he's gone home. And, and in, the early, in, in the early years of my ministry, I used to go home to Long Island. When my parents were still alive, and uh, I, I drive across Pennsylvania, and it was always a lot of fun to go home. And I, I'd meet with people there, you know, old neighbors get together, friend, old friends and, and neighbors, and and uh, that's what you do when you go home. Jesus went home. He went home. He went out there doing ministry, and he, he's developed quite a following. And now he's been so he's been so busy. It's been so kind of difficult for him to even get a bite to eat or get some. And people gather around him and there are family members who come to see him. It says his relatives show up. Who are they? Brothers, biological brothers, cousins, theologians debate that. Doesn't matter. Members of his family show up and they have good intentions. And you know what they want to do? They want to lay hands on him. They want to grab him. Lay hold of him. On him. For his own good. Because they think he's out of his mind. These are his relatives. These are, his whole family thinks he's nuts. Because they're hearing all this stuff about Jesus and what he's doing out there. You know, when I announced I was going into the ministry, my parents told me I was out of my mind. And they worked really, really hard to persuade me. And my father, when he, my father, even went as far as to say, if you go into ministry, you're going to wind up in Africa, in some little village, where you're going to be cannibals, and they're going to put you in a pot of coke and eat you. And uh, I can relate a little bit. But they really didn't think that Jesus was out of his mind, which may surprise you. John in his gospel says, quote, they did not yet believe in him. 
which explains some things. Well, they go to the ground for his own good, before he gets hurt, before he gets himself into a whole lot of trouble and they're concerned not unfounded. He's caught. He's been on the road. He's not eating. He's not sleeping. And in the midst of this chaos, come the fact that he has spies, the scribes, uh, they're religious teachers, and the Luke says they came all the way from Jerusalem. And they're probably sent because they've been hearing about Jesus and uh, and uh, they're going to try to maybe trip them up, uh, ascertain whether or not he's violating the law, uh, perhaps catch him on some technicality, some heretical teaching. And the reason they came from Jerusalem is that as Jesus was engaging in his ministry, some people started to question. They started to say among themselves, is this the Messiah? And what's worse is some people were already starting to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So the religious authorities and emissaries. And what interests them in particular is that Jesus has been casting out demons. And so they have come up with a, what, they're, what they consider an adequate contrary explanation as to how Jesus could do this, cast out demons. And here's what they came up with. A, he is possessed by musical. And number two, he's casting out demons by means of by means of musical. Who's musical? Well, Bezel, Bezel, the Jews uh, had come to use this term, this name, as a reference to Satan. And it was originally the name of a Philistine god, Baal, and the Jews, linguistic experts said the Jews picked this, this name on, and they, 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 they turned it into a vile term for Satan, who is the prince of demons. So the scribes do what? They go around slandering Jesus. They, they tell people that Jesus is doing his works by way of Beelzebul, by way of Satan. But Jesus hears about this and he summons the scribes to himself, which is very unusual for Jesus to do something like that. And he engages them. He says, fellas, I've heard what you're saying about and I'm doing good things, I'm doing good things, but I'm doing them by way of saying it. And he asks them to consider what they're, they've been saying, and what he asks them to do is to apply some logic. Logic. How can Satan cast out Satan? He said. And Satan and the demonic world are kind of rolled into one. How can Satan cast out Satan? He says, no reasonable person would say that. That Satan cast out Satan would not be a contradiction. Basically, what he's saying is anybody with two, two brain cells can figure this out. You know, why would Satan work against himself? And Jesus goes on and he offers some explanations, some like illustrations. He says, a kingdom divided against itself. Can I stand? Now, what Jesus is putting forth is a universally understood principle. A kingdom that is divided, where one part of the kingdom is fighting against another part of the kingdom, that kingdom's days are numbered. When you've got one part of the kingdom fighting against the other part of the kingdom, What's going to happen? It's going to self-destruct. The end result is ruin. Then he moves on and uses a very similar illustration. He talks about a household, basically a family. If you have a family, the, the image of a family, and the members are fighting with one another. The household is divided. You can't 
can't stand. Can't remain. Jesus is not attempting to be a political theorist. He's not uh, trying to play family therapist. He's simply stating a universal principle that any organization warring with itself, warring within itself, cannot stand. It cannot remain. In the exit discussion, verse 27, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods without first binding the strong man. You have a picture on the front of your bulletin today. The strong man bound. So what's that about? You know, I don't remember everything from my seminary days. But I remember one particular professor. His name was Lewis Brighton. And he was a New Testament prophet. And I was in one of the gospel courses. I, I, and, and, and I remember standing in front of the class. And he said, you know, fellas, he says, one of the main themes of the gospels, in particular the gospel of Luke, but the others as well, is Jesus is God's strong man who comes into the world to bind up Satan. And, uh, and uh, I remember sitting in class and thinking, well, that makes, that makes, that makes sense. Jesus, God's strong man, has come into the world to bind up Satan, to defeat him, to render him impotence. Jesus is in the process of doing this in our gospel reading. He's, in, he's already done battle with Satan wilderness, right? The temptation of Christ. And, 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 he's, and, he's, and he's living that sinless life for us so we can live for ourselves because of our sin. And he's heading towards the cross where he'll die and totally sacrifice for our sins. And then he's going to rise again on Easter Sunday morning. So casting out demons is in, during his ministry is a sign of uh, what Jesus is doing for all of us. Taking on the feet, sin, death, and the power of the devil. So we come out of the other end of this troublesome section of scripture with Jesus' commentary on sinning as the Holy Spirit. Right? People talk, that's a great source of discussion in the Bible. What's the sin of the Holy Spirit? What's the sin of the Holy Spirit that's unforgivable? You know, what is it? Drinking alcohol? Is it going to the school dance? Staying out too late, speaking back to mom and dad? People come up with all kinds of things. This unforgivable sin. And I still remember Professor Bright standing in front of the classroom. He said, the sin of the Holy Spirit, put it in context, the sin of the Holy Spirit is not just unbelief. It's going beyond that and calling Jesus evil. And ignorant of the Holy Spirit, the devil. Calling good evil and evil good. Because people sin in all kinds of ways. And the solution to sin is what? Repentance and faith. And what he was saying when he said to us that day is he says, what's being described here are hearts so hardened against God that they stand judged already in his life. Mother and brothers calling him to Sunday dinner. <laughs> and his people sit around Jesus at his feet. And he points to them and he says, See these people? They are my mother and brothers. God's spiritual family. Which is far more important. So shall we meet some application?
stuff that's going on in congregations and they are fighting. And what has happened is the pandemic has given occasion for all this stuff to bubble up in the surface. And division has raised its ugly head. So it is so important that we remain a family. It's so important that we strive to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now we do. We focus on Jesus. We focus on His person and work. We focus on His death and resurrection. We continue to proclaim Christ crucified and our common mission together. For Jesus is a great unifier. He is God's strong man who came into the world to bind up Satan so he can harm us no more. Make us a 
generous people, that we will be willing to share the resources we have given to those in need, and for the support of your church and the good work of your kingdom. Lord, be no mercy. Prepare us to receive your blessed gifts in this holy community, that we eat the bread of Christ's flesh and drink the cup of his blood with faith and repentance, and show forth its fruits in our daily life. Lord, be no mercy. All these things we've asked of the good Lord, trust in your mercy to grant us only what is best for us. Give us faith, trust in your mercy, that we may abide in your presence in peace. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated in your hours.
is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We join the singing the Agnes Day. May this 